Chapter 18 Depersonalization and Alienation Functionalist Cynicisms 1 Quoting Bertolt Brecht's Man ist Mann Stop! Don't do anything because of your name. A name is something shaky. You cannot build on it. The First World War had undermined the thinking of the ideologues who wanted to glorify the warrior. Its proper subject showed itself to be not the battle-stained hero, but the massive military machinery. The survivors expressed this experience a thousandfold. It forms the hard core of the modern dissatisfaction with subject-object ways of thinking. The individual subject now appears unmistakably as registered, drafted, uniformed, engaged, disposable, subject in the original sense of the word as subjugated. War spits out the new subject of the times, the front, the people at arms. This becomes the meta-subject of thinking marked by war. A little later it will be called the community of the people. In it, the members of the nation will be forced together as an illusorily homogenous fighting unit. As a historical alternative to this community of the people unto death, parts of the workers' movement, which conjured up the mega-subject working class, presented itself back then and came to think about its real interests in life. The time seemed to belong to the great collectivities, the individualist veil of bourgeois culture disintegrated. The war had consumed the warriors physically as well as psychologically. The man sank into the mud trenches, was torn to pieces by shells or mutilated. Here, a bourgeois dream of wholeness and personality comes to a horrible end. Those who recollect frequently mention castration by shells on the front. Uncountably many experience the defeat as a social, as a social, psychological emasculation. The war had already reduced heroism to a matter of factness in fighting. Now the defeat way made one more facticity out of it. In this way, I think, the oft-cited Weimar matter of factness touches in the first place on a military psychological state of affairs. In the following years, this seeps into the cultural style. The warrior as the coolly functioning engineer. The attacks by storm became the heroic deeds of matter. Storm of steel. Finally, in the modern war of artillery, the last connection between heroism and survival slackens. The bond between the soldiers and the weapon systems now is matter of fact. The man in uniform has to learn to regard himself as the human factor in the war of machines and to act accordingly. The general staff phrase, human material, increasingly stamps the modern form of self-experience and way of treating oneself. Those who survive must have learned to regard themselves, their bodies, their morality, their will, as things. The soldier's physical condition and moral attitudes provide only aspects of armament and battle equipment. In this point, war gave all modern moral philosophies a drastic graphic lesson. Morality is called the psychic factor of the war machine. Military matter-of-factness, so much of which will be inherited in an indirect way by Weimar culture, is, for its part, however, woven into an encompassing process for which Walter Rathenau, who was murdered in 1922, had found a striking formula, the mechanisation of the world. The book that develops this thought is still worth reading today, and not only because the author displays a style that is almost sensationally brilliant for a politician. Rathenau's 1912 On the Critique of the Times is the outstanding attempt of a bourgeois politician, who was also a successful entrepreneur and philosopher of respectable status, to analyse the essence of modern society for himself and his contemporaries. His starting point in describing the mechanisation of the world, however, is not the army, but the metropolis. Quoting Rathenau's Gesamtausgabe, volume 2, 1977, page 22. In their structure and mechanics, all larger cities of the white world are identical. Situated at the midpoint of a web of rails, they shoot their petrified street threads across the countryside. 
Visible and invisible networks of rolling traffic crisscross and undermine the vehicular ravines, and twice daily pump human bodies from the limbs to the heart. A second, third, fourth network distributes water, heat and power. An electrical bundle of nerves carries the resonances of the spirit. Honeycomb cells fitted out with silky fabrics, paper, timber, leather, tapestries are ordered into rows. Outwardly supported by iron, stone, glass, cement, only in the old centres of the cities, residues of physiognomical peculiarities are still maintained as almost extinct showpieces. While in the surrounding districts, no matter whether in the direction of the factories, residential or recreational areas, the International World Warehouse extends. At first, Rathenau devotes his attention to the process of construction, the outstanding form of piling up of goods in the modern world. Circulation of goods, he says, is the negligible, because uh, the circulation of goods, he says, is negligible beside the petrified result of production of goods. Humanity, and here he quotes the same text, but page 51, Humanity builds houses, palaces and towns. It builds factories and storehouses. It builds highways, bridges, railways, tram lines, ships, canals, water, gas and electricity works, telegraph lines, high voltage power lines and cables, machines and furnaces. The new building in German cities would, in the course of about every five years, probably reach a value that in mechanical expenditure would equal the construction value of Imperial Rome. What then is the purpose of these unheard of constructions? In large part they directly serve production, in part they serve transport and trade, and thus indirectly production. In part they serve administration, domicile and health care, and thus, predominantly, production. In part they serve science, art, technology, education, recreation, and thus indirectly, once again, production. Mechanical production has long since overshot the elementary goals of food, clothing, self-preservation and the protection of life. In continually expanding circles of production and consumption, it creates new desires, a measureless hunger for commodities that is increasingly directed at artificialities. Mechanisation thus incorporates even wishes themselves, quote from page 50, in the irreality, lifelessness and shadowiness of its products and fashions, end quote. Rathenau's conclusions hit unerringly the quintessence of sociological theories of alienation. Quote from page 52, Mechanical production has elevated itself to an aim in itself. End quote. This is the mental scenario in which the situation of humanity is determined. Rathenau seeks it at the productive centre itself, in the world of labour. A longer quote here from pages 67 and 68. Labour is no longer an activity of life, no longer an accommodation of the body and the soul to the forces of nature, but a thoroughly alien activity for the purpose of life, an accommodation of the body and the soul to the mechanism. Labour is no longer solely a struggle with nature, it is a struggle with people. The struggle, however, is a struggle of private politics. The most risky business, practised and nurtured less than 200 years ago by a handful of statesmen. The art of divining others' interests and using them for one's own ends. To have an overview of global situations. To interpret the will of the times. To negotiate. To make alliances. To isolate and to strike. This art is today not only indispensable for the man of finance alone, but, in an appropriate measure, is indispensable to every shopkeeper, the mechanised profession educates one to become a politician." Rathenau's anthropology of the labouring human being accordingly possesses two aspects. On the one hand, the labouring ego becomes an epiphenomena of the apparatus of production. On the other, they who egoistically pursue their own interest become ineluctably entangled in a kind of war, in diplomatic, polemical and political business. Where an ego appears in the modern economic world, there it must appear as politician, strategist, deceiver, calculator and diplomat. For every contemporary, political tactics go to the head. At the same time, this quote-unquote risky business of tactics descends to the last shopkeeper. 
The matter has probably never been presented so disarmingly clearly in such a compact space, where the ego does not want to become only a cog in an alienated, oversized machine. It must stretch itself in the other direction and learn the art that earlier was the sole province of the great figures of politics. It must go through years of apprenticeship and political cynicism. It is scarcely any better for our intellectual and psychical powers. Quoting the same text, page 69. The intellect, still shaking from the excitements of the day, insists on staying in motion and on experiencing a new contest of impressions, with the proviso that these impressions should be more burning and acidic than those that have been gone through. Entertainments of a sensational kind arise, hasty, banal, pompous, fake and poisoned. These joys border on despair. The devouring of kilometres by the automobile is a graphic image of the deformed way of viewing nature. But even in these insanities and overstimulations, there is something mechanical. The human, simultaneously supervisor of the machine, and machine in the global mechanism, under growing tension and heating, has surrendered his or her quantum of energy to the flywheel of the world's activity. End quote. With great physiognomic power, Rathenau sketches the psychology of the productive, consumptive human being. He discovers the puzzling banality of quote-unquote abstract ambition that forms a unity of drives with the equally free-floating hunger for commodities. Quoting page 74, abstract ambition is puzzling because all admiration is directed at the mask and from the mask to its wearer there is no inner band of identity. End quote. Between greedy masks, a network woven of acts of purchase is spun in which surrogates and surrogates of surrogates wander through the hands of consumers. In bourgeois households it comes to an excess of objects in whose consumption existence seems to exhaust itself. Ten years later, Henry Ford answers this thought in the book about his success, My Life and Work, published in German in Le Leipzig, 1923, in which he too confuses the view of the captain of the economy with that of the ethnologist, and like a pseudo-naive observer of capitalism remarks, from page 313. The advances of the world to date were accompanied by a strong increase in the objects of daily use. In the backyard of an American suburban home there are on average more appliances than in the entire territory of an African ruler. An American schoolboy is, in general, surrounded by more things than are an entire Eskimo community. The inventory of kitchen, dining room, bedroom and cellar represents a list that would have astounded the most luxurious potentate of 500 years ago. And the wasting away of traditional beliefs can only be counted reactively by the consumptive personality. It wants to cling to beliefs and value without being able to be the person for whom they still really hold. Quoting Rathenau's Gesamt Ausgabe, volume 2, page 93, now he strives with cunning to regain what has been lost, and plants little shrines in his mechanised world, just as roof gardens are laid out on factory buildings. From the inventory of the times, here a cult of nature is searched out, there a superstition, a communal life, an artificial naivete, a false serenity, an ideal of power, an art of the future, a purified Christianity, a nostalgic preoccupation with the past, a stylization, half-believing, half dissembled, devotion is given for a while until fashion and boredom kill the idol. The structure of modern credulity regarding values, which is a feigned belief in capricious and desperately restored values, brilliantly describes the mentality of those populist activist groups propelled by nihilistic anti-nihilism, which shortly after the failure of the German revolution did all the talking. From one of these groups came Kern, Rathenau's murderer. The first encounter during the first the first encounter between the first murderer and his victim took place in October nineteen twenty one during a public lecture in Berlin. Ernst van Salomon has recorded this scene in his novel, Die Geachteten, The Outlaws, Gutesloh, nineteen thirty. While Rathenau is speaking, Kern pushes forward to a column near the speaker's rostrum and forces the minister into the spell of his eyes, cold with hatred. Quoting Die Geachteten, page 
page 315. I saw in his dark eyes the metallic green shine. I saw the whiteness of his forehead. The minister, however, turned hesitatingly, looked at first fleetingly and then confusedly at that column, froze, sought laboriously, then gained composure and inattentively wiped from his forehead what had been projected onto him. But from now on he spoke to Kern alone. Almost entreatingly, he directed his words to the man by the column and slowly became tired as the latter did not change his stance. As we pushed through the exit, Kern managed to get close to the minister. Rathenau looked at him questioningly, but Kern shoved hesitatingly past him and his face seemed eyeless. Something of the spirit of the whole epoch is contained in this confrontation. Contained in this confrontation. The gaze of the nihilist perpetrator of the deed does not want to see what his opponent had in terms of intellect, goodwill and readiness to accept responsibility. Rathenau is supposed to feel that Kern does not want to listen. Hermann Rauschning, too, links up with insights such as those already presented by Rathenau in his book Masken und Metamorphosen des Nihilismus. That would be Masks and Metamorphoses of Nihilism, Vienna 1954, in which Hitler's erstwhile dialogue partner sketches outlines of a philosophical theory of fascism. The intellects that are worked up against modernity, Rauschning shows, are inclined during a crisis to cling precisely to that which nihilism has taken as its starting point, to the great social institutions, the state, the economy and the armed forces. They, the great promisors of meaning, are the principal agents who, quoting page 121, broadcast unconscious nihilism behind a facade of apparent order and forced discipline. What those who are unstable call to for salvation is in fact the source of the evil. The institutions to which the conservative anti-nihilists cling with gloomy sympathies are the real agents of nihilism. According to Rauschning, nihilism advances in two ways, values and truths. They are subjected to a progressive unmasking. They become transparent as surrogates and they are, as the functional lies of the great institutions stripped of all higher validity. At the same time, however, the social institutions free themselves from human control as means and elevate themselves to ends in themselves, in which individual as well as collective human existence has to subjugate itself. Quoting Ernst van Salomon's De Fragebogen, The Questionnaire, a contemporary writer who renounced for himself every organ of metaphysical speculation has expressed this process in a single excellent sentence, quote, when humanity emancipated itself from God, it probably could not yet guess that one day logically the things will emancipate themselves from it, end quote, and also end quote. Quoting from the same text, uh, sorry, quoting Rauschning's Masken, page 123. Human beings become the material of the economic process, the mere means of the state. And quoting the same text from page 130. The institutions, the regulations, the apparatuses of community order, the organs of European culture are no longer aids for humanity. The organs of European culture are not longer aids for humanity in establishing meaning for itself. That, that might mean no longer aids for humanity. Uh, I don't want to second guess the copy text editor, but anyway. <clears throat> they are means and tools of nihilism. They do not hang in the air. Rather, the entirety of human existence floats without any supporting ground and clings to the means of existence that have become ends in themselves as the only things that can be held onto in the whirlwinds of insubstantiality. What is here put forward by philosophizing statement, statesmen is confirmed in the works of contemporary writers. Among them, Bertolt Brecht claims a special status for like scarcely any other, he critically presented and experimentally thought through in his works the inversion of the bourgeois individualist understanding of the ego that had been decried as nihilism. He is the real virtuoso of the quote-unquote cynical structure. 
In fact, he grasps it as a procedural possibility and as a poetic opportunity. Pardon me. No matter how his share of subjective cynicism is estimated, he succeeded in making it into a means for representing reality. In his epoch, he became a master of the cynical tone of voice, and with almost every one of his plays, from Baal to Masnama, measure, he established his reputation as a poet who commanded a language that allowed the quote-unquote times themselves to speak. With Brecht, too, the stance recurs that we have found at first in Dadaist irony, letting oneself be thrown and pushed around by the given state of affairs, which is no longer counterposed by any flimsy ideas or upright poses. More important than self-composure is insight into what really confronts us. Quote-unquote, matter-of-factness functions as a form of going along, of being in the times. Don't fall behind. Don't let any resentments grow. Don't cherish any old values, but look to see what the state of affairs is now and what is to be done. We cannot live off the good old values. It is better to start with the bad new reality. Obviously, a new quality of irony and a non-affirmative form of affirmation makes itself felt here. In this irony, it is not a subject that has quote-unquote stayed clean that reveals itself, who distanced above the fronts, the malay and the tumult, tries to save its integrity. It is rather the irony of a bashed ego who has got caught up in the clockwork, rather like Charlie Chaplin in modern times, who makes it his hands, uh, who makes its hands as dirty as the circumstances are, and who, in the midst of the goings-on, only takes care to observe alertly what it encounters. With Brecht, too, the pugnacious irony appropriate to modernity makes itself felt, Cynical irony. It does not resist reality with imagined fancies, but exercises resistance in the form of unresisting accommodation. This irony's model piece is provided by Brecht in the famous interjection from the comedy A Man is a Man, the transformation of the packer, galley gay, in the military bar- barracks of Kilkoa in 1925. This interjection from Erster Stuka, Volume 2, 1953, pages 229 to 230. Interjection. Here Bertolt Brecht maintains, A man is a man, and that is something anyone can prove. But then, Herr Bertolt Brecht also proves that one can do as much as one likes with a person. Here this evening, a man will be reassembled like a car, without losing anything in the process. The man will be approached humanely, he will be requested firmly, without vexation, to accommodate himself to the course of the world, and to let his private fish swim away, and no matter what he is remodelled into, in doing so, no mistake has been made. One can, if we do not watch over him, also make him overnight into our butcher. Herr Bertolt Brecht hopes that you will see the ground on which you stand disappear like snow under your feet, and that you will notice about the packer galley gay, that life on earth is dangerous. For the clinical realist, the idea of human individuality in times in which war machines, metropolitan streams of traffic and unleashed production apparatuses consume the individual as their raw material is no longer a fruitful hypothesis. Let us try from the other end, free of any metaphysics of individuality and without humanistic nostalgia. Quote, a man is a man. What scenic arrangement must be set up in order to examine this cynical critical statement of identity? In his stage experiment, Brecht has the gentle family man become a bloodthirsty fighter, incensed by the, quote, wish to sink my teeth into the throat of the enemy, primitive drive from the family, to butcher the breadwinner, to carry out the assignment. Same text, page 293, end quote. Besides being him, quote-unquote, self, everybody can also be functionally the other, who, with a few tricks, is refitted as a, quote-unquote, human fighting machine. Brecht outdoes the nostalgic lamentations about alienation with a hard commitment to psychological functionalism. The point here is that he does not want to present any reduction of the civilised human to a wild animal, but a coolly presented remodelling of the civilian as soldier. 
thus no quote-unquote regression, but a mere displacement in which quote-unquote nothing is lost. The sole concession to the individual occurs indirectly, in that the playwright turns to the audience's intelligence and provokes it into swimming free of conservative inhibitions through the surrender of the cultivated bourgeois private fish and into immersing itself in an ugly but vitally seething present. <laughs>